Um, what's the last time I was grateful to be queer? My first experiences have definitely been like messy and less than ideal. How are these first experiences contributing to my gratitude to being a lesbian? Well, the fact that they occurred to begin with. I would not have changed anything. The last time I came out to someone, I feel like my life is a constant coming out party, you know? It's so, I mean, I'm coming out now. I'm talking to this camera and I'm coming out. Well, I didn't actually have to come out to this person and that was yesterday when I had my hair cut. <laughs> and I told my hairdresser that I was um, gonna be interviewed about gay stuff. Probably, the last time I probably had to come out was honestly probably with my parents which is a little bit ago, but that was still only like two or three years ago. Coming out to mum and dad was hard because I came out to them earlier on. I kind of said this was when I first thought that I was bi and I brought it up and it was an interesting reaction because it was almost like, it's not that they were saying it's wrong or they were like being straight up rude about it they were just like well how can you be both can't you only be one or the other but then the last time i came out so i was like i was very sure and like who i was and what i am and my sexuality and how it impacts my life and how important it is in my life and because of that confidence within myself i was able to like set that boundary the last time i came out of being like okay well you're either in or you're out the last time I came out to someone would have been just two days ago, where I just talk about my partner. I guess that's coming out. When you just say, oh, my partner David, and you just have this conversation about partner David. And I, I just remember watching their face going, uh, this will be a tell which way they go. And it just, they didn't even blink. They did, this is someone in their, what, they'd be in their 30s. Didn't, didn't even just, just didn't cross their mind. They said, yeah, fine, whatever. Whether they know or am obvious or whatever, they just accepted it. it was just there. And it's brilliant because nowadays I just don't think about coming out. It's not actually a thing. I don't sit down and go, I just need to tell you something. I'm gay. Is that okay? You know, I don't do any of that stuff. I just talk about my life and my life is with David. I told someone um, then I recently got married and they were like, oh, show us your husband. And I was like, oh, it's actually um, my wife. You know, like just those really small um, ways you come out to people who, yeah, just make harmless assumptions based on what they're used to. And I think the first times I had to come out, I felt heavy and maybe even like a little bit hesitant or embarrassed or like, like I didn't want to um, say something while well, now it's really just a really small adjustment it's like um, you know <laughs> it's no harder than when you're ordering a latte and you say oat milk and they're like whole milk and you're like no oat milk you know like that's what it's like now well, back then I would have been like just accepting whatever they gave me even if they messed up my order <laughs> The last time I came out to someone was probably really recently because I have to come out to people a lot. Um, like, whether it's talking to someone on the phone and I get sir and I have to be like, no, sorry, it's like, whatever, ma'am, ms, whatever you want to do. I mean, like, people always feel embarrassed, I think, when they get it wrong, oh, sorry. And like, that was sort of something that I did find frustrating is like people get it wrong and they're like super apologetic. But I think what they're actually looking for is for me to comfort them about their mistake than for them to comfort me <laughs> about getting it wrong. And 
that can be a little frustrating, I think. Um, but I, I guess it comes from a good place. I really don't know. Like my my nibblings, maybe. Like my nieces and nephews. Like I guess like the last time I had to come out is like I had to sit one of them down and be like, you know, you know that person that you think is like my best friend. The good news is they are my best friend. The other news is they're also my girlfriend. <laughs> um, and this is, you know, like, this is kind of what the, what I am. And they're never really surprised. Like, they kind of get it. They understand. I think kids are a lot smarter than we give them credit for. But yeah, I think that's like the last time I would have had to like, come out. The last um, queer related TV show I watched was And Just Like That. <laughs> it's the a uh, sequel to Sex and the City. We have Miranda um, dating a non-binary comedian and um, their name is Shay Diaz. And Shay is like dating other people and one of the um, Charlotte's kid has come out as non-binary and has changed their name from Rose to Rock and Charlotte was like struggling with losing her little girl and just little things like that um, that we don't generally see or haven't previously seen on a show like it because um, I think the more we see non-binary representation on screen the easier it is for the general population to accept it in real life. Yeah, so I just watched Red, White and Royal Blue and that was really exciting because one of the main characters is a bi guy and it's quite funny. Every time a new queer film or TV show comes out, I'm always a little bit apprehensive because I'm like, oh, they'll probably have a bi character. I wonder what it'll be like. And to see this bi man represented so beautifully, so wonderfully, without judgment. Um, one of my favourite lines uh, was from the character's mum. She said, the B in LGBTQ plus is not a silent letter. And to see that on a, on a show that I know millions of other people are watching, I just went, yes, like, awesome. When I watched Red, One Royal Blue, I put it up on my Instagram, I put it on my Facebook, I was talking openly about it and talking with everyone about it, um, getting people's opinions. And compare that to when I first started watching queer TV shows like Queer as Folk when I was a kid and, you know, hiding with my little portable television in the middle of the night. Um, I didn't want anyone to know that I was watching it. And now it's such a, a big part of my life getting to talk about queer pop culture and media. Um, it, you know, worlds apart. Worlds apart, it's not a secret I'm, I'm holding on to anymore. It's a, a shared experience being able to watch these things. Um, so yeah, huge difference, huge difference. And even what's represented on the screen is, is so different. It was a, a certain idea of, of what queerness looked like back then. And now we've gone into a far more diverse and, and less judgmental and open-minded sort of way that we're representing queerness, queer relationships, queer people. It, it's awesome to see. The last queer related TV show that I probably watched and successfully finished um, uh, was The Ultimatum Queer Love. What I really loved is that the conversations that the participants and the cast members were having with each other were so much more like diverse and so much more like deeper than the conversations that they were having in the heterosexual counterpart of the show. Um, you know, they were talking about things like gender and like what it means for them to like express themselves and it showed how queer people really try to go deeper with their relationships and deeper with their connections with people and talk about things that matter more than just, you know, nice weather we're having, <laughs> um, you know, and you look hot. <laughs> the last like, big queer show I watched was um, the kind of like remake of A League of Their Own, which like scratching all the itches, like lezzy content, you know, sports, <laughs> funny people as well. It's quite funny at times. Because if you go back and you watch the original movie, like there might be some implications of homosexuality in there or whatever, but it's not like sort of explicitly shown off and it's good that we've got to a point where they can tell that story again in what would probably be a more accurate way where like yeah they a lot of them would have been gay um and like that is an important part of the like the drama and the story being told and how would you say the representation has changed it's there for one thing we have representation and the reputa the representation is 
very often, most, and it's mostly positive, the characters don't go through any more trauma than any other character. You know, they live or they die, according to the plot line, not because they are um, spawn of the devil and, and need, to, need to die. I just love the idea that the more, it's actually so mainstream. Could you imagine a TV series coming on board now without a gay character? No, I can't even imagine it. I can't even remember, I went, Dawson's Creek. I remember Dawson's Creek and they go, oh, it's a gay character, but he's pretty vanilla, he doesn't do much. But good on him, that's there. But now we're seeing kind of gay relationships played out, queer relationships played out on, on television. They're allowed to kiss, they're allowed to, they're allowed to do all these things, amazing that that's what the straight world has always had, we now have, because I think we're in charge of it more. Everyone wants to come to a gay party, they always have. I feel like queer TV storytelling has changed immensely since the days of Queer as Folk. You know, I think there was always like a, a degree of like, I always felt really naughty or watching the like shows like Queer as Folk, which was, was important for its time, but in many ways it was exoticizing the experience of queer people because it was like from a white male lens, you know, and I never felt included in that conversation. I feel like now in terms of diversity, we're seeing diversity for diversity. Even RuPaul's changed. I was watching a program on YouTube uh, about um, how RuPaul has, you know, she had things that might have been offensive to trans women that she's changed over the years. And um, now she's actually having trans women in her shows, which she never had before. So um, even, you know, there's an evolution even within the drag community. I think things have evolved and they're getting to where I like more, which is representing queer people in a way that fits in with the story, I guess. I love um, like a queer film that's specifically about a certain person in queer history and we're going deep into that. That's beautiful as well and that's needed. But in also I love that we've now come to a point where the queer relationships are like just normalized in the film. They're not like this big like crazy thing. I don't know how to explain it in like words. I would really like more um, teenage and like young adult love movie series that are about like, you know, the romantic relationships whilst trying to live life and be in that teenage to young adult life, which is like such a crazy growth period for so many people. I feel like there's quite a few of those sort of movies out, but in like straight relationships. And I think it'd be really cool to have those sort of movies, but you know, the person is queer, person of color, deals with disability, like, specifically disability as well. I also think super important to have more like autism representation in movie and film that isn't the generalized, like the stereotype autistic, I think, because that's like harmful. I know when I watch TV series and, you know, they make the um, autistic person seem a certain way, which they do in a lot of films, that's like harmful for me. Like when I'm watching, I'm like, oh. Oh my God, imagine if I said I recently follow Queen Kong. <laughs> Wouldn't that be hilarious? <laughs> oh. Okay, so one of the main sort of queer content creators that I follow, mostly on TikTok, is 100% that Tim, <laughs> um, who is actually Hannah Conda, one of my best friends. She was on Drag Race with me. It's her brother, her little brother. And the reason why I follow him is because he's so just funny and joyful, and the content that he creates is just really um, something that we need, which is a laugh. <laughs> you know, I think things get really serious, and so, He's probably one of the, the main content creators that I follow, yeah. A couple that I've been following for a while that are uh, from Australia, that Taz and Alicia, I believe is their name. Love their content, love them. They're so, they talk about everything, which is so important. And I love that they answer a lot of questions regarding like navigating queer relationships. They also do like funny stuff on the side. It's like their whole 
um, account isn't just their relationship. They also just show like them trying the new KFC chips that's come out, the new ice cream. I do follow some people who post in, in relation to activities that are going on, um, demonstrations, what have you. But since Twitter became X, I've just sort of dropped off that completely. I can't figure out, you know, when, you, when you're on Twitter, you tweet. I mean, what do you do when you're on X? <laughs> I recently followed this Instagram couple who travel together. They're called Wonderful Wives. They're really cute. They're always going on adventures and I love their content because I can save it for places that we could potentially travel because it's still something that's in the back of my mind. Like what if we go to a place and we won't be able to like hold hands or show affection publicly. That would kind of ruin my whole vacation. So thank you at Wonderful Wives for <laughs> highlighting like the spots that you go to and where you are able to holiday and not like be worried about homophobia. I'm grateful to be sitting here right now talking to you. I'm grateful that I am me. I'm grateful that I don't have to pretend to be anybody else. I'm grateful that I'm allowed to express myself so freely that my voice is heard. From a, a time when trans people were, had to live in darkness and on the fringes of society, we can now walk in the light and enjoy community and enjoy society. I'm grateful when I go to work. I'm grateful to go into the office. I'm grateful to have a job. I'm grateful to be safely in an income. I'm grateful to be dressed by fashion designers. I'm grateful for everything. I am grateful. <laughs> Probably at the same time I felt grateful for being left-handed. Like, is gratitude a relevant feeling to have about just who you are, it's just who I am and I, I guess I have got gratitude for that because I, I don't have to do the heterosexual wrangle that to me seems to be quite complicated. Growing up in Malaysia um, and being told that being queer is mental illness and if you're a gay man, you'll get HIV AIDS and die, and that you're a bad influence to your siblings and all those things, and being punished for being queer. Um, it's taken me a long time to, to unlearn all those things and to, through community, through finding community and um, a lot of therapy too, <laughs> live an authentic life fearlessly and and finding gratitude that I can now express myself the way I am. I feel grateful to be queer every hour of every day. I, I feel so lucky because I, I look back at what I've been through and I'm so grateful to be where I am now because there are many other timelines where I wouldn't be in this position. Um, to be able to look back and know that I, I did a good job um, and to be proud of who I am as a queer person. My first experiences have shaped me as a person and informed everything that I know is important to me now, like going through feeling insecure about my sexuality, through not knowing whether I was non-binary or not, and doubting myself, that whole process has kind of just illuminated all of the parts of myself that I know to be true. I'm grateful to be queer every day, really, um, because I think it's put me in a position to meet a lot of really cool and interesting people, whether it's like living really authentically as my queer self or engaging with other people who are doing the same. It always seems to make things better. If I hadn't gone through what I had gone through in both negative first experiences and positive first experiences, I don't think that I could have been the person that I am today 
or the person that I'm striving to be. I've definitely been through a lot of trauma, a lot of loss, you know, a lot of growing, a lot of mistakes, you know, and I think I would not have changed anything, you know, as much as the struggles, some of the struggles have been really difficult. Um, it's really um, taught me a compassion and a, um, a sense of community, like a, a real like driving sense for community, knowing that, you know, if it was just about myself, I probably would have given up a long time ago. I think a lot of my first experiences uh, were not good, were full of pain, full of anguish, shame, um, full of what other people thought of me. And that is so different to who I am now. You know, it's a cliche of that whole, you know, it gets better, you know, it gets better, you know, they say it, but it's so true. When we don't make those safe places and supportive places and loving places for those first things to happen, we, we lose those people. Uh, and, and, and the world is worse for it. Like I look back on those hard things and I'm like, they were, not meant to happen, but like they happened and I can see the good in them now because now I can be open with people and they can have that safe space that I didn't have. What can I give back so that, you know, the next generation don't have to feel those feelings.